passage, Acts chapter 21, Numbers chapter 6. I'm at the edge of a sneeze, so hopefully it passes soon. <clears throat> it's going to go away and come back when I least expect it. Amen. Wow, what a, what a, what a month we have. December was pretty much wholly given towards the nativity as far as our time as a whole. And, and I believe this is where we left off. Um, uh, I'll not spend too much time. I won't spend any time d doing a recap. Maybe next week I'll get more into that. But uh, we've been going through Paul's missionary journeys, and we're nearing the end of his third missionary journey. And you say, well, what are we going to do after that? I have no idea. No idea. But on Wednesdays, this is where we are. And, and I don't know if we have a couple weeks or if we got five weeks left. I don't know. But I've sure enjoyed the study. Uh, I know for me, it's, it's been wonderful uh, learning our Bible on Wednesday nights. Um, I feel like we've covered a lot of ground just in the past two months, let alone a couple of years. Um, but picking up right where we left off. Oh, I'm curious to see. Interesting. That's good. Well, then, I, was, I wondered what, what thumbnail you'd make for this. Amen. Acts chapter 21, verse 15. And after those days, we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem. There went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought uh, with them one manation of Cyprus, an old disciple with uh, whom we should lodge. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry, which would have been a lot of things to particularly mention. Amen. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. You know, we see things like this today that people that... that could very well be born again believers, yet not rightly dividing the word of God, whether it's from what the denomination tells you or your pastor teaches you, or or you're looking at the Old Testament and you're trying to apply something that was given to a particular people at a particular time, like animal sacrifice or whatever you want to name, and trying to apply it today. We, we see those kinds of things. Well, it was a hot topic back then. Because they were so used to being under the law and under the law. But here they are, the elders are telling Paul as he's coming to town, hey, you, you see how many are following after Christ. He's saying that they believe in Jesus, yet they're still zealous for the law. We can apply that different ways, like, you know, the legalist crowd or whatever you want to do. And, you know, and just like you'll never meet a liberal Christian, you'll never meet a legalist Christian either, right? Because nobody ever admits where they are or self-identifies with that. And you think, well, how does that apply to us? What can we do about that? 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And, and, and to me, that's the main focus always of the, the verse, right? We need to study so we're not ashamed. Um, many times in my life, and we could all probably say the same, and I'd probably lead the charge in it, amen, where we'd be in a conversation or a situation, we, man, if, if we had the right Bible verse, we could really be a blessing. Or I don't have the answer biblically for this, so I can't really uh, 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 help in this situation or insert anything we didn't have. We weren't studying enough to give an answer for what the Bible says. I harp on it all the time, but what do we, what do we always do? What my pastor says, my church says. I hope that Hope Baptist Church, that's nothing that we ever say, well, my pastor says, or my church believes. I hope we don't do that. But we can say, actually, I studied that for myself in January of 2022. That was the th topic that I chose to study, and I can show you what the Bible says about this. But it's not just study to show thyself approved on the God of workmen that needed not to be ashamed, but the end of it that we kind of forget, or as I do, it says rightly dividing the word of truth. What's that mean? Context, context, context. Who's it talking to? Uh, what's it applied to? What's the situation? Who, what, when, where, why? Are we supposed to uh, kill a lamb when we sin? No. Brother Riley, would you pray for the message, brother?
Amen. There are divisions in Scripture without a doubt, and we, we know about these things. And, and divisions, just one, God dealt with the Jewish nation differently than anybody else. Well, we say, why? Because that's who God chose to bring the Son of God through, Jesus through. So it can't just be anybody. It had to be a specific people, and that's why there's specific things that God had them do for a specific time, and that's not the message but that's just one division in Scripture. So now when he's talking to the, the, the Levites, well, who are the Levites? Well, that's the, 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 the spiritual leaders amongst the Jews. Here's the thing that fix my tie here. And by the way, I've had people tell me things like, um, oh, man, your collar was up for the whole message, or you had spit on the side. It, you can tell me during the message, it's a okay. Amen. Yeah, right? Um, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. We're even now. We're even. Specifically for the Jews that were trying to stay under the law, here's the thing, and, and, and we are living it today. But it was a hot topic for the Jews, and I can't stay here long, but um, Jesus was the final sacrifice. We know this. That means, that means um, the, the law was no longer necessary. Not that it wasn't, uh, uh, um, it was fulfilled. It was schoolmaster. Thank you. It, was, it wasn't that like, oh, the law. That, no, thank God for the law because it brought us to this place. But now there's no more need of this and there's no more need of that. No more need of priest. Priest's job is gone. There's no more need for sacrifice because the sacrifice came. This was the message of the gospel. I mean, the main, the main thought from the disciples was, man, he's risen. The resurrection. 500 people saw him. Eyewitnesses. It happened. I'm going to give my life. You can torture me all you want, but I saw that he was risen. But also, he was the lamb. We're not under that law anymore. Dispensationalism is a hot topic lately. And it's not necessarily a bad word because you can even say there were different dispensations in that God dealt with people differently throughout history. As in God dealt with the Jewish nation differently because they were the chosen people to bring the Messiah. But it never meant that salvation was different. Let me not get on that rabbit trail. Amen. Um, so there were saved, born-again Jews here. They believed in Jesus, but yet they wanted to continue in the rituals and in the traditions that they had always done. And, y'all, that sounds familiar. I mean, we've been going through Catholicism, but, I mean, there's Jews today. And, and, and even in a Baptist circle, there are people that, that do what we do because that's what we've been taught. That's what we've always done, so we do that, and that, we don't even question it. Like, I don't know, that's what my church always does, so we do it. And, and not, not bad intentions. You got, I mean, heartfelt people wanting to serve the Lord. I'm, I'm saying that these, these Jews here that were following Jesus, they, they weren't saying, no, I'm going to uh, hold to the law just in spite of Jesus. No, they were probably had a heartfelt, no, God always told us to, to follow the law, so we're following the law. That's what, you know, we were all, we've done that. We've been faithful to this. And they were wanting to keep to that. But the whole gospel message was, we're not under the law anymore. Amen. Um, my dad turned, her, where are we? Acts 21. My dad, this is what he would say, if I get it right. We need to be careful not to get so wrapped up in the work of the Lord that we completely miss out I'm the Lord of the work. I see confused faces. As in, as in, there have been times this year, last year, where I've pushed so hard to get this and that done, where all of a sudden, it's now 11 o'clock Saturday night, and I haven't even started for the Sunday morning message. So now I'm so tired, I'm going to jump into studying instead of, instead of spending time on my knees like I should before I study. 
getting busy in the work of the Lord is missing the Lord of the work, keeping the main thing the main thing. So there were Jews that were so steeped in their traditions that they were missing what Jesus was teaching as a whole. Acts 21, 21. And, and, and they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews uh, which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after their customs. customs. What is it therefore the multitude uh, must needs come together? For they will hear that thou art come. Then they, they went on to tell Paul, they said, Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepeth the law. Interesting. Look at verse 25. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. Who are the Gentiles? We are. Anybody that's not a Jew is a Gentile. Verse 26. Then Paul took the men. And the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple so sig to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. Who took the vow? Well, Four men did, and Paul shaved his head with them. And the shaving of the head, and we'll get to that in a minute, indicates the end of the vow. So Paul joined in with the end of a vow, even though that was under the law. And you hear Christians debate, well, why did Paul do something that was under the law when he was under grace now? I'm really good about my notes for me. And um, unfortunately, tonight, um, while the boys were singing and Brother Tony was reading the letter, I, I wrote in some extra notes, but I can't even read it up here. <laughs> like, what, what, what's that about? I'm so, I'm so spoiled with the computer-typed words. Uh, what is it? Cal Calibati, uh, number 10 font. Amen. Oh. I know what I wrote. What is it? Where did it come from? <laughs> um, why would Paul do something that was under the law? Go to Acts chapter 18, verse 8. Acts chapter 18, verse 8. First of all, I don't think this is the first time that he did this. Practiced a Nazarite vow which is under the law, even though he didn't, doesn't have to do it because he's under grace now. <clears throat> Acts chapter 18, verse 18. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. We have an Aquila renting our Wayne house, Aquila and Craig. So Aquila just hits home, amen. Um, except... Um, if I'm not mistaken, Aquila was the uh, man name in the Bible, right? Yeah. Uh, I hope our renter is not hearing this. She'll be offended. Amen. <clears throat> it says, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Centria, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Who took the vow in those last two verses? Probably Paul. Notice how Paul's the context through both of the verses. The narrative is built around Paul. The author's telling you about Paul, and in doing so mentions Aquila and Priscilla are there as well. Jump to Numbers chapter 6. What's this vow we're talking about? It, it's, it's the Nazarite vow. Highly likely that's what it is. And in Numbers chapter 6, there's a description of the Nazarite vow. Who's this vow for? 
the Jews, the God's chosen people, specifically the Nazarites. Amen. Numbers chapter 6, verse 1. Is the description of the vow. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and saying to them, When either a man or a woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord. Now, just to be clear, and this is important, you didn't have to, um, it, it was kind of like fasting in a way. You don't have to fast, but you can. Consecrate yourself Show the Lord how serious you are. You're looking for an answer in your life. Go on a two-day fast, three-day fast, five-day fast. Letting God know that you're serious about what you're about it, right? So that's kind of the same as how a Nazarite vow. You didn't have to take a Nazarite vow. Where am I? Verse 3. He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any uh, liquor of grapes. Uh, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled. In the which he separates himself from the Lord, he shall be holy and shall let the locks of his hair grow, uh, locks of the hair of his head grow. So when when would you shave your head in the Nazarite vow? At the very, very end of it. Jump over to verse 9. And, a, and if any man die very suddenly by him, and he hath defiled the head of his consecration, then he shall shave his head in the day of his cleansing, and the seventh day he shall save it. Jump to verse 21. This is the law of the Nazarite who hath vowed, and, and of his offering unto the Lord for a separation. Besides that, his hand shall get according to the vow which he vowed, so he must do after the law of his separation. It, it's hard to read sometimes when I have thoughts in my mind that I want to say, but, but I'm still reading, but I'm trying to think of what i got to say. Amen. So, so consider this. A Nazarite vow was an undesignated amount of time. It was like fasting, kind of. You can make it a lifetime like I believe Samson did, or you could do it for a specified number of days. But the shaving of the head was only done at the end of a vow, which is important. I'm trying to point that out, unless you came in contact with a dead body. So if Paul shaved his head in Acts chapter 18, which I think he did, that shows that Paul was already putting himself underneath the vow in requirements of said vow. Did Paul have to? No. Was Paul under law anymore? No. But did he? Yes. Why? Why would Paul do something that was under the law when he didn't have to and he was under grace? We got time. Let's turn to Deuteronomy 23, 21. Deuteronomy 23, 21. We're doing good on time. I'm just trying to point out if, 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 if in Acts chapter 18, Paul shaved his head because he was under a vow, then in Acts chapter 21, it wouldn't have been such a far jump for when he met these Jews that were under the law for Paul to shave his head as if he was already under a vow personally in his life. You say, Pastor, you still haven't answered the question, why would he do something that was under law when he's under grace? I'm speculating, because I can't read Paul's mind, but look at Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 21. When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it. For the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, it would, and it would be a sin in thee. Surely, we know that Paul knew his Old Testament scriptures. And he knew that if he made a vow to the Lord that he'd better keep it. Look at Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. It's tempting to go fast. I'll give everybody a minute. Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. 
pointing out that these scriptures would have been in his mind. Numbers 30, verse 2. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. That was heavy on his mind, I'm sure. Now turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. Say, Pastor, why are we talking about a Nazarite vow and keeping a Nazarite vow? And why on earth would you go to Matthew and listen to the words of Jesus when Jesus was preaching grace and yet they were underneath the law? Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, Jesus said, Again, you have heard that it's been said by them of old time. What was he referring to? Deuteronomy and Numbers. Jesus said, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oath. I think I'm speculating that Paul made a vow to the Lord, said, Lord, I'm going to practice this Nazarite vow. I'm going to honor you with that. He didn't have to anymore. But he continued to do it, particularly to be a witness to the Jews. As, we're gonna, as, as, as we saw there in Acts chapter 21, why, why did he do it for the gospel's sake? Here we have in Levitical law, it says that you need to perform the, the vow that you, you made, whatever the vow was. But again, Jesus is teaching the same thing now under grace in Matthew. What does that tell us? That church is what we call a biblical principle. As in, Brother Tony's thinking, do I need to do a Nazarite vow? No. But if we vow a vow, we ought to keep it. God was serious about it to his people, and he taught his people that in the Old Testament. But again, Jesus brought it up in Matthew, saying, do a vow, you better perform it. I don't believe that Paul had to do that vow at all. But for the sake of the weaker Christian, for the sake of the gospel, they were zealous for the law, but yet they, they loved the Lord, they loved Jesus. They were born-again believers, but they were taught this. And Paul probably figured, probably, these are a bunch of weak Christians, that are, and if I don't shave my head with them, they're going to think that I have uh, shunned the gospel, and that's not the case at all. Grace, it, it was, it was a, uh, God, Jesus came to fulfill the law, not to shun it. Jump to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. A few more scriptures, that's all. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. Paul probably took the Nazarite vow in Acts chapter 18, and he definitely performed it in Acts 21 as well. And I believe in Acts chapter 18, uh, or 21, I can't remember which, which it was, it was in Corinth when he shaved his head. And, and here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I believe that Paul is explaining in a letter basically why he did this, even though I don't believe he mentioned it specifically. It, let's read it. You see what I mean? 1 Corinthians 9, 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. And to them that are without law, as without law, uh, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak I became I as weak that I might gain the weak. I, I have made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake that I might be partakers thereof with you. I, I've heard it. It's actually taught at Northridge. Actually, I'll call it out. That's fine. A guy went, a uh, person I know went to Northridge and their Sunday school teacher was teaching and using this verse to justify, and I'm not joking, going to strip clubs and bars to be a witness to folks. Because to the weak, I became to the weak, and to them, I became to them. That's some shallow teaching. That's not what Paul's teaching here. 
So why would we ever do something that we don't have to do? I'm talking to the Christian tonight. Why would we do something that we don't have to do for the sake of the gospel? Why would we spend so much time trying to help a brother or sister in Christ, spinning our wheels seemingly, maybe possibly very well? Why would we spend so much time trying to help a brother or sister when we don't have to for the sake of the gospel? Why would we allow people to talk bad about us continually for the sake of the gospel? Go to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. We have this mindset of, um, as a whole, as a whole, there's a mindset of what can I get out of church? I was talking with Jessica about um, um, bigger churches. Well, I might get in trouble for saying this. But I told Jess that I would, if, if I lived way out in the boonies somewhere, um, I would, and, and there was a very limited number of churches, and there was no church that I believed with. There's no KJV church. There was no Bible-believing church that believed in born-again salvation, yada, yada. I would rather go to a little Pentecostal church that used the KJV Bible than some sort of Northridge mass service where it's going to be liberal and, and, and watered down. Where's that going with that? I forget what my point was, Brother Riley. I bet it was good, though. <laughs> I don't know. Acts chapter 16, verse 1. See, Paul had Timothy circumcised. If I, if I lost the rabbit, y'all. I lost the rabbit. So let's just get back to the message. Acts 16, verse 1. Then came he to Derbe and to Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish, a Jewess, and believed, uh, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of, uh, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra at Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him, and look at this, and took and circumcised him because of the Jews, which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. Because of the Jews is not a term of endearment. Timothy didn't have to be circumcised, but he did it because of the weaker brethren. From the one that has the mouth yapping nonstop. Go to 1 Corinthians 8, 8. While you're turning there, I'm going to read Galatians 2, 3. So if you would turn to 1 Corinthians 8, 8. That'll be our last scripture to turn to. Galatians chapter 2, verse 3 says, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. But Paul's saying, hey, Titus was with us. Uh, uh, um, but he, he, <clears throat> but he, wasn't, he, wasn't, um, he wasn't compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, that's unsaved folks in the church, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us unto bondage. There were Jews coming in saying, oh, yeah, yeah, we're born-again believers, but really we want to see what they're doing. Then we're going to call them out for not doing the, the legalist thing or the under-the-law things that we believe. And, and Titus saw that. He was apparently accused of not being circumcised, circumcised, but he wasn't compelled to be circumcised. Timothy got circumcised because of the Jews, but Titus said, no, I'm not going to. Verse 5, to whom we give place by subjection, not, uh, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. If we would have kept on reading, uh, Paul there in Galatians is where Paul withstood Peter to the face. Because Peter got wrapped up with the crowd where they were like, oh, we, we believe in Jesus Christ, but yet we still need to be under the law. Paul stepped up to him, to his face, and was like, you're wrong, brother. That's Jesus, the, the, the lamb came. The sacrifice came. We're not under the law anymore. Quit trying to mix 
tradition. Quit trying to, quit trying to mix uh, the old law, the old covenant with the new covenant. You can't do it. Paul said, Peter, we need to rightly divide the word of truth. So Paul is letting us know that Titus didn't feel compelled to be circumcised just because of busybodies in the church. Paul said they were unsaved folks trying to cause problems. Man, if you, if you accuse somebody of being unsaved in the church, oh my goodness. You want to talk about gossip, it won't run rampant. First Corinthians 8, 8. But meat commendeth us not to God. Talking about food, meat. For neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. The context of the scripture, and I try not to bring in too many scriptures to it, but the context is um, there were folks saying, whoa, that's not, we can't eat that meat. We need to be under the law and be under this. We need to put ourselves under this. And, and Paul's saying it doesn't matter what you eat. It's, you're not the better or the worse for it. We're not under the law. Verse 9, he says, but take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. We have liberty in Christ. We have grace. We're not under the law. There are principles that, that, that we can gain from it, that, that we can glean from it, that, that, that sure, God taught his people. Of course, there's going to be biblical principles that carry through, like, you know, um, don't kill. Of course, that's a biblical principle that, that comes through. You know, people want to say, no, we're not under the law, so none of that applies. Some things are principles that apply. Jesus even taught, and we just pointed that out a minute ago, right? Because we need to, what? Study to show that self-approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, but also rightly dividing the word of truth. Word of, word of God, word of truth. Truth, amen. I, I know, I know, amen. Look at verse 13. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. How do we know, and we're closing here in about one minute, how do we know if, if a brother or sister in Christ is weak in the Lord? You know, we don't walk around with meters, you know, or hats that say weak, mature, which, by the way, we'd also be a lot less mature than we think we are. You know, and if, and if we had a meter up here that, that showed our spirituality, you guys would be thinking, why is he our pastor in the first place? But how do you know if somebody's weak in the Lord? They're offended at everything. Everything offends them. Great peace have they which love that law and what? Nothing shall offend them. Oh, <laughs> I got it right here. Yeah. Psalms 119, 165, amen. As speaking from growing up in a pastor's home and now being a pastor... There's a whole lot of things that we find ourselves doing in life that we would rather not. And I assure you, there's a lot of things that we do for the, in ministry that we would rather not. But we do it. Why? For the sake of the gospel. For the sake of the weaker brethren. You know, why do we come to church when it's so stinking cold outside, like a bunch of crazies. We've been working all day in, in church. I've had a longer three days at work than I've had in, in probably three years, and I'm not kidding. It, it, I am piled on. I'm stressed. I'm worn out. My shoulders are achy. That's not normal for me. Why would we come to church on a Wednesday night, and it's dark at 530 for the sake of the gospel, so my boys see that we're serious about what we're doing. So Hope and Wyatt realize that, hey, they mean what they're saying, that they're going to they're gonna, um, not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, that they say, hey, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to make a commitment. I'm going to be there, that we're there. And also, it's encouraging when we're here singing these songs and singing hymns. Man, it's encouraging when there's more than three people. And sometimes that'll happen with COVID. I get it. But it's way better when more people are here. Amen. 
But why do we do it? For the sake of the gospel. Paul did it. Timothy did it. And as parents, it takes sacrifice to raise babies. And so it is the same spiritually. It takes sacrifice to grow the weaker. And that's not just the pastor. That's for, that's for the older ladies. And I'm talking about, I'm talking about if you're 20, you, helping the less than 20 ladies. If you're 50, helping the less than 50 ladies. For the men, hey, the older, helping the weaker. It's not just the pastor's job to do these things. That's our jobs as Christians, to help the weak. Amen. Amen. Brothers and would you close us in a word of prayer?